resume recording. So thanks very much and, and welcome along. We're going to focus today on uh, recruitment retention, uh, mainly in the adult game, but hopefully there'll be some shares across both uh, age grade game and um, and both male and female. Um, really happy to be joined by a couple of clubs tonight to kind of share those examples. So hopefully it won't be too much of myself talking or us telling you what's, what's there, but more clubs sharing examples of what they've done, um, where it's come from, what the rationale behind the kind of topics they chose and what the outcomes have been. Um, so I'm really happy to um, welcome on. So we've got Stuart Wells from Oxford Harlequins. Um, we've got Brian Elkerton from Prenton Rugby Club. We did have Adam, but he's been stuck at work. I'm hoping Neil might jump in from Gosforth when we get to that stage, uh, not to put him on the spot, but I've just dropped him a quick message. Um, but that'd be fantastic if you could. Uh, and Paul Hayes, um, fresh off a, a rivals win at the weekend against the, the, the local derby from St. Austin Rugby Club. Um, and, and they're going to share some of their experiences of what they found work really well for recruitment and retention within their club as well. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to share as many examples as possible um, from both of us. But what's always worked well and what we've noticed works really well on, on these types of calls is um, is the chat box and sharing examples between each other. Um, so either sharing common challenges you've had within your clubs or, or how you've overcome those challenges as well. So please do um, feel free to to chuck as many things in the chat box as possible. Um, and if you're happy to to share those as well, we, we might just pull, call upon you. Uh, not to put you on the spot, but um, the, the whole kind of focus for tonight is to kind of share examples from clubs um, and see what's gone well. Um, so the topics we're going to cover tonight, but not exhaustive, are a um, quick introduction about the kind of what, what's going on at the moment. Oxford are going to look about how they've um, supported their club through um, local education links or universities and colleges. Brian from Prenton is going to talk us through the work they've done in contacting past players and some of the work they've done in the community. Um, Gosforth were, Neil, I'll put you on the spot here, we're talking about the new coaching team and equipment as well. And St. Austin are going to look at their kind of club philosophy, their vision, the Saints way and how that's helped as well. We will look at just common, because I know all clubs mentioned it when we asked them what they've done is about the kind of use of social media. Um, and we'll share some examples of that and we'll ask the clubs to kind of feed in what successes they've had from social media also. Also joined tonight by Laura, who's one of our club developers, who will also be sharing some examples, especially from Durham, especially in the female game, around what kind of key things have been done um, to recruitment retention. The female game certainly leads the way on a lot of things to do with the recruitment retention, kind of building teams overnight, and, and also bounce back through COVID probably stronger than in most parts of the game. If anyone's got any questions, please feel free to put in the chat box. Um, but the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to go over to um, Oxford Harlequin. So, Stuart, welcome along and, and thanks very much for your time. Thanks for having me, Dave. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, um, I'm going to so, talk about the, um, the, the idea of partnerships within a, a club setting and sort of go from my own experience. I, I took over as um, director of rugby at Oxford Quins in 2019. And uh, it was actually quite helpful looking back at some of the stats. I'm not sure how many of you guys use Spond or Team or similar, but on Spond, I was looking back at where we were um, at the start of 2019, where we had a men's first 15 that had been for seven years at level six, hadn't gone up, hadn't gone down, been pretty much in the same place. Um, had finished 10th in the preceding season. Um, and on that first couple of training sessions that I had in September, 2019, on the first Tuesday and first Thursday, uh, 14 and 10 guys attended respectively. <laughs> uh, on the Saturday, we canned the twos match because we didn't have any numbers. Uh, and then on the following Tuesday and Thursday, 11 guys attended each of those training sessions. And on the 14th, we had a, a ones match, which I remember going to at Old Patesians, and a twos match where I borrowed seven under 18s, under 19s, and three members of the executive had to pull on their uh, their rugby boots again to make up a 15. So it was, it was pretty grim. And I, I think there's probably a few clubs in the country relating to that sort of experience. Um, we had no women's rugby at all. And uh, realistic squad size was probably around 16 to 20 players for the for the men. That's the entirety of Oxford Quins. Um, and then I just did a quick comparison to where we are for the same weeks in September 2022. And on Tuesday the 30th of August this year, uh, 52 guys attended. Um, on the 1st of September, 61 men attended. And on Saturday the 3rd of September, 60 players turned out for our first, second, and our new third 15. And we won all their matches, which was nice. Um, 
Uh, the squad size now is based around who's actually paid their subs and is attending, which is 85 uh, players and have an average attendance on a Tuesday and Thursday of 55. Um, we also now have two women's 15s that are competing in NC1 and NC2. So um, looking back on, you know, I'm going to do, just focus on one particular aspect. Obviously, there's a lot, lot of things and a lot of people have done a, a lot of really good work here to, to improve the situation from where it was in early 2019. And obviously, we had the last year of the pandemic. But um, one thing I, I did when I came to Oxford is to look at the um, environmental advantages that the city affords and each city will have different environmental advantages but one of the key ones here was obviously you know we think of Oxford I'm, I'm sure you all think of the same thing which is universities we have the University of Oxford and we have Oxford Brooks University and so um, the big focus of clubs around here seems to have been on focusing on Oxford University which, which was the wrong university frankly because Oxford Brooks um, as I soon discovered uh, was incredibly interested in in talking, collaborating, um, looking at ventures that we could do together, um, very outward focused. And so right from the outset, um, I, I sat down, particularly in that year that we lost the pandemic to, to build relationships and to um, understand who the stakeholders were and what they wanted, and what they needed, what they were interested in from their perspective. So that meant engaging with the, uh, the university head of rugby, um, the president of the university rugby club, the captain of the rugby club, getting to know the players and their perspective, their wants, their needs. Um, then talking to the head of university clubs, the sports clubs, and then from there the director of sport and, and so on and upwards. And what came out of that was that, you know, it's very easy to go into these situations and say, we want more players, but that, that's not a great way to start a conversation because effectively what, what do they want? And what, what I was looking for was areas where we could cross over where our potential goals and their potential goals could align. So we looked at um, some key areas which we, we started building, uh, first of all, a memorandum of understanding and then the formal partnership around, which is now called the Brooks Quinns uh, Partnership. And those key areas were participation in that uh, most universities in this country are not box super rugby universities. They're not spending 150, 250,000 a year on their rugby program. They're spending more like 12 to 15,000 a year on their rugby program. And for them, as much as performance is important for their first 15, what's also important for the students is participation. So we looked at saying, how could we get more students involved in rugby on Saturdays, as well as on Wednesdays when they play for the university? Uh, linked to that was the idea of a performance pathway, that the most able students would have a pathway to play on a Saturday in, in the men's leagues. And then when we started the women's section with the women's leagues, and how we could facilitate that and make it more professional than what they're experiencing at the moment, what we could bring to the conversation to um, in terms of coaching facilities, resources, um, and opportunities to help them to have a, a better rugby experience at university than they would have without us. Um, obviously there was a large piece looking at collaboration on facilities um, in a city like Oxford, where there isn't a lot of green space because it's mostly owned by the University of Oxford. Um, it's how do you leverage to the greatest extent the facilities that clubs like us offer and it meant that we could start to collaborate on now all the Brooks teams um, train at Oxford Quinns uh, that's men and women and we're starting to make the facility open to other sports teams from the university as well and that's much longer term vision that we're looking at um, resource development and resource sharing uh, the we started off looking at could we help to fund the coaching program at the university it wasn't big money but it was enough to make a real impact. And then secondly, could we help them culturally as well? One thing that we've really helped with, I think, is the, the culture of the university um, rugby club. So now uh, the guy who was the head of rugby has moved on to a great new job. Um, we then recruited our own head of rugby for the university, which was Tom Vandell, which was obviously they were very happy to have an ex-premiership player in place there. And it really lifted the profile of the university and the players are, are doing really well. But then that program for the both the men's and the women's rugby program now comes under Oxford Quinns comes under me, which means that um, we're able to to steer it a lot lot better and and to uh, make it work better. Uh, there was um, we looked at community engagement, the idea that the university wants their students to be out in the community, getting involved, getting experiences, and how we could facilitate that. So we started exploring uh, setting up a, a school's coaching program, whereby we would go uh, train up the students, get them DBS checked send them into um, uh, local primary schools and secondary schools to provide PE lessons, to provide uh, after school clubs, 
Tom Vandell manages that now with, with his uh, community manager hat on. And there's now 15 schools engaged in that program, uh, primary schools and secondary schools around Oxford. So on one hand, it's giving students great career enhancing experience of being sports coaches, teaching PE lessons, delivering PE lessons, delivering at, uh, after school clubs, working with young children, uh, particularly for those sports science and education and, and students, it's really good for them. For us, obviously, it's another source of income because schools pay to have coaches come in. Uh, and it's it helped us to really engage with our community as well as part of that program. Um, we've done a lot of work around career development, which is, as you can imagine, a lot of WhatsApp groups uh, linking students up with our sponsors. Uh, our sponsors are much more interested in us when we start talking about having undergraduates than they were if we're just, uh, you know, asking for boards on the side of the pitch and so on. Because uh, frankly, you know, everybody has a recruitment problem at the moment. So you start talking to a local property firm about a university that has a property development course, then everybody gets much more interested. Um, and the way it's worked out is, I think it's fair to say that when we started the 2021-22 season, the first match, the, uh, the third 15 was pretty much 70% Brook students putting on the shirt uh, for the day. Uh, but one dynamic that I've discovered is, is that players' numbers results in players numbers you know when you have high numbers you get high numbers and what what seems to be happening is that people feel much more confident to turn up and say look i can only play for you maybe once twice a month because uh, of my job and we're able to say that's absolutely fine because we've got the numbers if you can play play if you can't play don't play paramedics military whoever they are you know we're able to 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 do that and there, there, i think there's an impression that we're all students and the truth is when i look at it um it's true that 30 percent of the First 15 on the, from the last weekend were, were the highest performing sort of Brooks students. But the second 15 and the third 15 that are going out now are 95% just local community players and guys who've, 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 uh, are now alumni of Brooks and have stuck around the city. And that dynamic was really one that really surprised me. Um, we've, we've meant that the, the program that's being delivered there works really well. But um, then I, I always go off in different directions, I apparently. The, uh, the exec here will tell you I'm a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> so, uh, other things that we've done is we have the Brooks Quinn's Physio Development Program. So this was trying to solve a problem, which is that we were paying about 100 to 150 pounds uh, a week for a uh, physio. And then again on the Saturday to provide pitch side support. So I looked at what does the physiotherapy department need? What, what are their wants? And they have a drastic shortage of real experience that they can provide to, um, to their students. So we looked at developing a program for final year uh, master students in physiotherapy to say could we uh, provide a program rather than a placement a program whereby they can gain experience on a Tuesday and a Thursday working under qualified physiotherapists that are employed by the club they would then be gaining experience of um, MSK and, and sports injuries and rehab uh, and conditioning and then on the Saturday we uh, decided to pay for 10 students who apply for this course every year to receive the uh, pre-hospital immediate care and support qualification from the RFU. So then they're qualified then to provide pitch side support up to, I think, National One. Is that right, Dave? Is that sound all right? Nod, yeah. <laughs> they, I'll yeah. check on the regulations, I think, but yeah, I think you're not far off there. Yeah, but the, the big thing is for us is obviously it solved a monetary problem because we're not paying them on a Tuesday and Thursday the week with the incomes going the other way on that one. Uh, on the weekend, we're not paying 100, 150 pounds per pitch sider and they're, as everyone knows, they're in short supply all the time. We've got two uh, pitch side medics who are qualified all uh, in, in bibs for five senior matches and the academy match every weekend. So there's great provision for the players. They know that they are getting taken care of in a way that they probably wouldn't get outside of a prem club. And it just gives people who are amateurs who are giving up their time to play, put their bodies on the line, frankly, for the club. It gives them that extra support and assurance that they're going to get um, well taken care of. Yeah, it also talks to, you know, good reasons why players leave the game. You know, my role as player retention manager in England, we, you know, we speak to players as, as often as we can. And the most consistent one that comes back each time is that injury or fear of injury. So, you know, having a good physio program or pitch side care or, you know, knowing they're going to be looked after is going to kind of play to that and ensure, you know, that will support that retention as well. Yeah. We've got a couple of questions coming in, but just one of the questions I had just, to, you know, before we pass on is just, um, if yeah. you're going to advise clubs, on like the one or two key things that you think were the most you know really important things that allowed you to create that link um and you know and benefit from that kind of good community engagement and bringing players in what, what would those kind of one or two things be and what, what would you recommend to other clubs um, I, I think listen to what the other organization that you want to partner with listen to what their needs are listen to what their priorities are and and 
find out what their goals are and see if you can align them with yours. If they align, then it's worth continuing the partnership. If they don't align and you simply want players and they, they, don't, they don't care about that, then it's not a conversation worth having. But there are definitely opportunities to be had out there. The Sixth Form Colleges as well. I think there's some great, we, we've uh, done some work with City of Oxford College. Um, I think there's more to be done on, on that front. But uh, we've done a small girls school, for example, near here. Um, the independent school, it has no pitches. So that immediately means that we have something that they don't. We have facilities. So they, they're now sponsoring our girls rugby program, which is new. And last week, last Thursday, we had a hosted a girls rugby world cup where 200 girls uh, under, under 16, under 14 and under 12 turned up, most of them trying rugby for the first time. There were some England, play, ex England players down there. And suddenly you've got this huge enthusiasm, but that's come about because their desire to, to offer rugby wouldn't be possible without our facilities. So the partnership works. So listen, yeah. listen to what the other organization wants. Yeah, that sharing a facility, that's something that, you know, most clubs are, um, you know, do have facilities they can share and, and support. So that's, yeah, that's a good way of, of kind of making that approach. Sarah's asked there, did you approach as a whole club or was it, do there a specific team focus for, for you as a club? Or did you, you know, did you go down on saying, look, we're, as a whole club, we'd like to, to kind of work in partnership as actually our first team or our women's team, for example. Um, initially, it was me me talking to the head of rugby at um, at Brooks, uh, okay. about what they wanted, what we wanted, and seeing exploring partnerships. And then we didn't have a women's section at the time, but that quickly became part of the partnership. And we wouldn't have a women's section without the Brooks Quinns partnership. They provided, um, you know, the seventy percent of the of the players initially came from Brooks. Now it's thirty percent, but you know. It wouldn't have started without it yeah of course yeah i mean yeah university rugby is a, a great um where a lot of you know female players will start their rugby career as well obviously that's coming getting younger and younger nowadays but definitely in the in the past it's been you know a great way to to bring players uh you know new to the game is there anything else to to, to finish off if you're going to pass on one bit more of advice is there anything else you think is worth you know consideration for other clubs um, I, th I think just have the conversations, you know, uh, we can, we can become quite insular sometimes. And so one thing I did when I arrived here is had lots of conversations with Oxford City Council, um, reached out a lot to the universities, we got some dead ends, you know, realised that some people weren't worth talking to or weren't interested in collaborating, but have a lot of outward focused conversations and you'll probably find there's more organisations out there that are interested in partnering with you than you realise. Fantastic. Stu, thanks again for your time. Really appreciate that. I'm, I'm guessing you're going to stick around and, and be on the chat if anyone's got any yeah, further sure. questions for him. And um, But yeah, thanks very much. Good luck for the rest of the season. And um, I'll maybe come back to you on a couple of other points or feel free to, to chuck in the chat if there's anything to add there. But thanks again. Um, thanks very much for that. I'm going to um, bring in um, Brian from Prenton Rugby Club. Brian, thanks very much again for your time and coming on. Um, we're going to talk around contacting past players um and also some of the work you've done in community um but it might be worth just um talking through you know kind of where you came from where you were around the covid times and, and where you are now just to give a bit of people context if that's okay yeah it's fine yeah yeah well Trenton rugby club we are a, a really grassroots community club uh on the whittle there's 10 clubs in eight mile radius so that's right yeah it's 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 very overpopulated uh so we had to go with something uh, we were, last season we were struggling to get one team out uh, and we realised we can't get on like this what can we do so the idea was, was to bring in new coaches because the coaches we had were ex-players this that and the other and the sessions were very well organised or attended so we advertised for coaches and we got two lads who used to coach uh, uh, coach side New Brighton they come along and they were after a few coaches we interviewed, these were the best, we thought. They were young, raw, but you could see the enthusiasm. Uh, we asked them what they would like. Uh, we got a scrum machine, we got that serviced. They wanted uh, new training balls, all that type of stuff. Uh, physio, we got, we got them a physio. Uh, they wanted the VO cameras so they could watch the train and record the games, which we did. Um, so once we got all that together, there's a huge development going on the club at the moment, by the way. Um, that's another thing anyway. So we decided to have a tennis tournament. So with that, we rang around, never text the players or email past players. We rang, spoke to them on the phone, explained what the day was about. It's a tennis tournament. It's a family day. It's a barbecue, bouncy castle. Bring your, bring your family up and look at the developments and look what we're looking to do. Anyway, it was a, a brilliant success. 
people come up, like what we were doing, uh, the families enjoyed it. Uh, on a first training session, where were we getting? 10 or 12. Believe you me, 10 or 12 was good. Uh, <laughs> we were getting about, about 40 turned up. Never fantastic. But on top of that, the lads had the, the session all planned out. The cones were out, the pads were out, the balls were out. It was a really good organised session. And the feedback from the players was fantastic. They enjoyed it. Also, what they do, they turn around, if you don't train, you don't play, and they stuck to the guns. Last season, lads didn't train just to, because we were desperate to get players out. Yep. Now, you've got these lads who didn't train. They're training because they want to get in to the first team. Um, and also, now we've got a second team. With that, we've got a good crowd coming up for Saturday. So the bar's doing well. There's big atmosphere at the club. It's, it's buzzing. We were, obviously, we, we pay these two lads, but the benefit we're getting from it's not a lot of money we're paying them but the benefit we're getting we're getting extra bodies on the pitch yeah. in the clubhouse they're bringing friends up they want to be part of what we're doing first team's doing well second team on top of their league uh, so it's like it's, it's, it's a family club really. it's a family club you've got to start somewhere and this is where we're starting yeah but we've got uh, because of the success we're having more and more people are getting involved it took a while to get where we are by the way uh, and some of the past players They've set up um, getting the junior section going, a mini section. Last Saturday, there was about 100 kids there, which Trump was parking, this, that, and the other. We didn't expect that many to turn up. Um, boys and girls were all playing together, parents loved it. We got an extra 15 paid members from the parents come up there, want to get involved. Uh, and from that, there's people who can help with the developments. Uh, so we've gone to the schools. We've always said to the schools, when you have your matches, come to our club, rather than play in the school grounds, come to our club, we'll put some food on for you, uh, bring your parents up, so the parents and the kids can see the clubhouse, because the kids are getting the clubhouse, a lot of these kids playing football, they see the clubhouse, get to know the, the players, they realise it's not a posh sport, <laughs> uh, you know, and they, they, they enjoy it, and it, it, we're getting a benefit from it, so hopefully in a few years' time, we'll reap the rewards, and so with the development starting in the summer, that's going to bring be a massive boost for the area because it's you can say it's a deprived area, but half a mile away, there's houses well over a million, two million pound. Mm. But our, our estates they're very overpopulated, uh, and a lot of these kids don't play rugby; it's football. But once they, they come up, we've got a few lads come up involved in training, and they're telling their mates, so they come up. Yeah. And we're getting about twelve lads come up from, from the school, local schools, and they get to know us. And, you know, we, we, we buy them kits, we get them tops and struggle with stuff, we get them stuff. Yeah. And it's, it's been, the feedback's been really, really good. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. Picking up on that, but you do quite a bit on the community as well, don't you, in terms of a club, yeah. you, try and, you try and connect out to the best you can. Do you want to talk us through a couple of ways you do that? Yeah, well, what we did, um, we've got this Sporting England support us now in a big, in a big way. Uh, they fund us by 55,000 to get the development of the ground. But how it started, we had a, um, there was a side area to the first team pitch. And if a ball went, up, went in there, you'd buy a new one, you wouldn't look for it. <laughs> so we had local war councils come up and he'd heard what we were doing. We were doing it for a while, getting out there. And it was just having a community garden. But I thought that that's never going to work there. Anyway, they gave us 12,000 for the new fence. So we said, well, give us the 12,000. We'll buy the material. We would have fence up ourselves, which we did. And the money over we spent on... Um, containers, equipment, this, that, and the other, a uh, polytunnel. And from that, we've got the schools involved, the scouts come involved. And if a Monday, a Wednesday, sorry, a Wednesday and a Saturday morning, it's a gardening club. So all the kids come up and they plant, we planted uh, about 500 trees around the ground. Then we built uh, a picnic area on a bit of land. And that we've got, a, uh, a group called the Paul Avell Foundation. That's male domestic abuse. Uh, and they use a facility and they set a picnic area and there's a few benches in honor of, of, of him, which then leads down to um, a nature trail. Now, the nature trail was vandalized by 4B4s a while ago and it would stop now. And that land goes on to National Grid land. So we spoke to National Grid. They seen what they're doing and they want to help the community. So they are now putting this new pathway through for the community. And now the council have come up because everyone gets to know what we're doing. The council want to put a, a pathway and a cycleway which links 
to our club where it's a stop off points. They can have something to eat, tour the facilities, sit in the picnic benches, or even get involved in the garden, then link up down to the pathway. So it's all up here. It's, 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 I wouldn't say it's big news, but the words getting out what Brenton are doing. Yeah, yeah. So, so we're trying not just to be a rugby club, more than a rugby club. Okay, we play rugby, but because in the past up here, they've had the local community centre closed down, the youth club closed down, the local pub closed down, the football cage taken away, all for the development. Mm. So we are now, with our plans, increasing the size of our club to make it a community club. And we've got various groups using it now. We've got Nick and Nats using it. We've got after-school fitness clubs for the kiddies. We've got a, a tiny touch using it. We've got the Ukrainians come up for uh, for bowls of a Saturday morning. Yep. So it's more people using it. So really, the club is empty in the week. Uh, by the way, we've also got a, a golf driving range using our facilities Monday to Friday, which, right. helps, us, which helps with security as well. That brings an income in. So the footfall is increasing all the time, and more and more people are seeing what we're doing. Uh, really impressed with it. We, we're going to have, have a Monday and a Wednesday. We've got, uh, well, we're going to have little harpies, people with heart conditions. They're going to kit the gym out, part of developments. They're going to have it from 9 o'clock till 12 o'clock, Monday to Friday. Um, after that, we've got the use of it. So it'll be, afford- it'll be affordable price of local community. But on a Monday and Wednesday, it's going to be a youth club. So the kids off the estate, boys and girls come up. The next thing is get them out on the pitch. Yeah, I was thinking knows, that. I'll be transferring yeah. to rugby players after that then, isn't it? Well, that's it. Get them involved yeah. in the club. They can use the gym facilities. There'll be fitness going on as well. They get to know us. And we can get them outside. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully, they'll tell the mates what's going on. Put a few discos on for them. It's, it's, it's getting these kids off the street and some of them are tough lads. Yeah. Um, you know, and you get them involved and it gives them a different outlook on life. It does. It's a, it... Yeah, it's amazing how much there's like a simple thing as in t- changing a bit of land that was a bit of scrap area, you know, into something more usable, c- created that link with community and opened, by the sounds of it, 10, 12, 13 other doors to, you know, to get more people into the club. Yeah, it's, it's just, what it is, Dave, just think outside the box. Just think yeah. outside the box. Most clubs, uh, and it's not just our club, other rugby clubs would be tennis clubs, cricket clubs, anything. Think outside the box, get the community involved. It's there. And one thing, got... um, sorry, just to, I'll, I'll, I'll let you come back. Just one thing that um, a lot of this will stand and fall on, isn't it? It's about the, the volunteers who are able to do this, isn't it? Like, you know, clubs yeah. are always looking for new volunteers. It, it, there's always a job to be done. There's always more jobs than there is people, isn't there? How, have you, how do you find that? Because like a lot of what you said there will be very reliant upon you know, good people volunteering the time. Yeah, it is. We've got the club members doing it. Uh, that was a slow process, but it's getting more and more, more and more people are getting involved in what we're doing at the club. And yeah. you've got the community people coming up. You've got different groups using the club now, using the garden. And yeah. it's, it's basically, a lot of it is is getting out of the house, mental, right. you know, mental health and well-being, and they're all talking, having a chat. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and they come from the estate, see what we're doing, and they want to get involved. So they can see, and the benefit, we also have the community payback uh, of a Monday and a Tuesday. The people, obviously, have got community service to do, and they come up and they take pride in what they're doing. Yeah, and yeah, they've yeah. been their partners, they show them what they're doing. They cut the grass, they make benches for us, make bird boxes for the kids, they make book hotels for the kids. So it's getting them involved. One of them now started playing rugby for us. Well, there you, you go, know, that's uh, a new angle of recruitment. Well, that, it, it's just getting the word out there and yeah. getting people involved. When you contacted the um, when you just going back to one of the original points you mentioned a while ago, when you were contacting the past players, what what are some of the things you thought was a big hook to get them back into the club? You know, obviously, you know, clubs will, will contact and speak to players quite often and say you're playing, and they'll no, not not today. Like, yeah. what what was it they thought well, actually? This is the reason why we got you know ten or twelve ex players back playing for us. Well, a lot of it, David. A lot of them just text or email this, that, and the other, and people don't respond. If you, if you actually speak to them or go and knock on the doors, which we did, <laughs> yeah. you know, we put flyers out and everything, and we knocked on doors, do all that. Uh, and we told them about the tennis tournaments. Come yeah. up, bring your family. There's bouncy castles there. There's barbecue there. It's all free. Have a chat and see what you think. Look at the, the plans for the new developments. And a lot of them come up, and they want to get involved, and they started putting the boots on. Some of them not every Saturday, but they can play like a gentleman before, they can play when they can play. Yeah, of course, yeah. That was you another know, thing we're, we're noting quite a lot is that to run a team now, 
you need a lot of players because we're not able to play week in week out a lot of family yeah. work you know and, and social commitments and that's what we hear back so growing that number you can play the odd game that can help out when when others can't isn't it well, that's it, Dave. We're speaking to them on the phone and getting them up here and pesting them all the time to get them up. Once they come up, they've got to see their old mates and this, that, and the other, had a drink. And they start coming up for the Saturday and then, then they get playing again. Uh, and it's something they've missed. Yeah. Just, it, the longer they're away, the, the harder it is to get them back. Yeah, yeah. And once they forget once they're, yeah, once they're in. Yeah, I think once it also back. helps. I think it also helps around a club that's got, you know, doing positive things, isn't it? You don't want to come back to, you don't come back to a club in turn and, you know, well, we're struggling to get this out, but you know, even if you didn't have numbers at the time, I think you were able to communicate a good vision. You know, we're, we're investing in the facilities, we've got some new coaches, we've got some new equipment. It just adds that kind of value that I'm coming down to something that's going places there. You know, I think it doesn't have to be huge, does it? It doesn't have to be a huge redevelopment. It's just a case of no, no, having no. a bit of refresh. This is what we're doing, this is how we're doing it. We'd love, love you to be involved. Also, Dave, what you do when you go to local businesses, uh, companies, we, we're not just going for the rugby club. It's going for the community, and that's the the tearjerker because the, everything was taken away. We're providing facilities that the council unfortunately can't afford yeah, to. Of course, yeah. So, so we're going to do it that way. And um, our pitch side boards, we're getting plenty of them. What we've said to our players: if you every board you get, you get a twenty five pound beer voucher on your card. Oh, well, there you go. So, so there you go out and get a board. And it's surprising the amount of people who know who can do things for us. Yeah, like we had a. Um, I can't remember his name now, uh, from the RFU, Festa Grasshoppers uh, consultant coming on to give us some advice and, and guidance of as where we are now and where we're looking to go in step rather than go from there right to where, we, where we'll where be and we, we can't manage it. Yeah. So what he did say, go to all your members, ask what the profession is, what the trade is, what jobs he do, and yeah. can he help with the development? Skills or the... Uh... Yeah, and, and, and that's a simple, simple thing to do. Never even thought of it. And we got a good reply. In fact, we got one an architect who was a, a 3D artist impression to finish development, which we were going to pay, pay about four to 5000 for. It. Now, he's doing it for nothing. That's his job. There you go. Yeah, that's that's a, a simple thing like that. One, cl- one um, question that's come through on the chat is there, do you have kind of staff running your clubhouse, hiring it out or kind of multi-use for other organisations or is it all volunteer-led? It's all volunteers at the moment. So, but obviously, we've, 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 we've spoken about getting full-time staff when the development kicks off. Uh, but we have volunteers and that that really make, that makes our money functions. Yeah. It's, it's but Every weekend it's full. And that, that's what gives us, Dave. The, the, we, what we did, we spent money on the clubhouse to take the rugby look away if you like uh, and we put the rugby memorabilia in a lounge and then the, the clubhouse was all pictures of the old area uh, so it didn't look like a rugby club when you come in but we got that busy people were turning up at six o'clock half six for the function and people were still there for the game and like Henry Kissinger he was trying to keep everybody happy um, so then we decided we could we need a bigger clubhouse so this is what's happened now you see yeah. and that will give us Give us an income, sustainable income going forward. Yeah, That's fantastic. What Brian, thanks very much for your time on that. Appreciate it. Things I'm kind of picking up from there, is similar to Oxford, is that you know the sharing facility seems to be a really good way to engage that community. Um, you know, having a hook for those players to come down. I think you talked about a tennis tournament. You're like an easy thing to come and get involved. We're not asking to commit yeah. to a huge amount. It's just come back, have a run out with us, and then reconnect yeah. with the, the way you liked it, and then just. You know, thinking a bit differently in terms of that community, um, yeah. community piece and things uh, is fantastic. So just yeah. think outside the box. Just think outside the box, and there's there's, there's, there's opportunities there. Yeah, no, fantastic, and uh, yeah, wish you all the best with that, Brian. Again, I'm sure you'll stick around if people have got questions on the chat. Yeah. We may come to you again later in the night on on some of the social media stuff. But Brian, thanks very again for your time. I very much appreciated. Um, I'm going to invite Paul now. As, as I said. Um, Fresh off a, a local derby, when was it, Paul, against Truro at the weekend? So everything must be feeling a lot rosier than, than it did last week uh, after a win like that. Um, but yeah, you're going to talk us through about the, the, the philosophy of the club and, and the vision that you've, that you've been trying to put in place. But again, a bit of kind of where you come from, where you are now, and, and some of the things you're doing in between would be fantastic if that's all right, Paul. Yeah, no, no problem. Um... Yeah, so yes, always good to uh, uh, be smiling on a webinar after a big win. <laughs> um, so uh, my name is Paul Hayes. I'm 
chair of uh, Sonostal Rugby Club. Uh, we're based in Mid Cornwall. Um, we current uh, our first team, the Saints, currently play at uh, what would be level six. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is something that sits alongside the previous two presentations, really, which is it's about having something uh, a framework around which to to hang those initiatives broader initiatives along and realize that uh, you, you you probably need to think about where you're going as a club and how you can develop if we look back to 2010 um Snostall was uh, uh, had gone through a series of successive relegations uh, they were down we were down to one single team playing in uh, uh, you know the virtually the lowest level of the, of the leagues at the time we had less than 100 people attending um matches on a saturday and our youth section was sort of withering a little bit on the vine we roll forward now to to where we are now we've we, we've now got three senior teams we've reintroduced a third team after uh, an absence of nearly 25 years and um uh, called the spartans um we uh yeah saturday's game as has already been mentioned was a derby so it was a little bit exceptional so there was over a thousand people in attendance but our average gate for a first team game now is 500. um we uh, have a youth section now which uh, by cornish standards is very very large it's around 300. we have teams at every age grade um, but probably the 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 key is that out of the three sides that senior sides that took the field on Saturday, uh, just shy of 90% of them had come through our youth academy. So um, what we're looking at is that uh, you know how we we developed that integration between the senior and the youth section to make them one integral part, and we called it the Saints Way. Um, we see ourselves as one whole club. Um, if you go back to, as I mentioned at, at, at the start of this journey, the sort of Saturday and the Sunday were almost um, fragmenting into different um, independent entities. And we've worked hard over a number of years to, to draw them back in. Um, what we have is a, is a whole club vision which wraps around the way we, we develop our players and value um, the experience that they have on and off the field. Um, you know, picking up on something that was mentioned in the Oxford Quins, we try to do our best in terms of player welfare and look after them. We start to recognise that there are different types of rugby. There's there's the, the sort of uh, you know, highly competitive you know, focus, which is aimed at more the first team, right down to a more social um, um, uh, and uh, fun type game not that the seniors don't have fun, but which we would, which we focus on with the Spartans. What we try to do is that as we we take our youth team on a, on a, on a, on a journey and their pair and the parents of the players, so we put a lot of emphasis this time of year on uh, in inverted commas on boarding new parents as much as getting the players. A lot of the parents are, are touching rugby perhaps for the first time. Um, you know, they, they might not be used to the ethos and, and, and the traditions of rugby. So we tried to um, bring them in that. We talk them through how we expect their, 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 their children to develop their skills and enjoy their time uh, playing rugby through the various age games. So we have a, a sort of skill matrix that where we hope they will be at various milestones through their careers as they as they develop as young rugby players. Um, we also put a big focus on on our coaches. We try to develop the coaches and the team managers involved with youth, and we um, create a number of pathways so that as they move through the key transitions in youth, then into cults, and then eventually into seniors, we try to remove the the a lot of the challenges young uh, young men have in moving from cult rugby into into adult rugby and we're starting to see that now having the benefit we are we are retaining uh, mo nearly all of our cult side that do not go to university Cornwall suffers from quite a big brain drain no more than they'll probably end up at Oxford Brooks and play <laughs> um but 
but the point being is if they're staying in the area we want them to stay playing rugby and we we, we, we and we're now having a great deal of success with that um similar story with training numbers that that, that was mentioned by the quins there um we, we we typically get 50 to 60 players training tuesdays and thursdays so but that that has been a journey where we've we've we've, we've been on for a while um how we've started to to break down those barriers we we have coaching networks across our youth section where our senior coaches are involved and our senior players are involved so not only supporting the coaches but actually helping them on 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 some of their sessions throughout the season um we roll in our uh, the we rotor in each age group to be uh, ball fetchers we don't call them ball boys anymore because we've got a lot of girls playing rugby now. Um, so we every Saturday we have um, uh, you know an age group team uh, supporting the first team match by uh, you know gathering the ball. And we're now seeing I think I counted on Saturday ahead of this there are eight players in our first team who six years ago were acting as ball fetchers for a first team match. So it just shows that continuity through the club is is starting to come through and we also uh, you know once a season have a wear it red day where we get the, the whole youth section to come along to a first team match and that is quite a sight to see when you've got uh, two to three hundred excitable kids all wearing some hostile colors um and uh, you know that, that that's a big part of it um what we found is that to be successful on the field any success on the field needs to be matched by a degree of success off it you need to be able to provide a stable and consistent purpose of where you're going as a club, how you're developing the infrastructure. Um, we put a great deal of effort into generating revenue off the pitch to keep rugby on it. That's that's our ethos. Um, we uh, similarly to um, to the guys on the Wirral, we we are a big focus uh, on on being part of the community. Um, Cornwall is a is a is a an, you know is not a, a fairly is not a rich area. There's a fairly impoverished area. We have quite a high de uh, high instance of poverty in the area. So it's an, you know so we actually see that as an opportunity to engage with the community, get them embraced, and again like you know like the last presentation, we get people who have no connection with rugby getting involved with the rugby club, and then. What we're seeing now is that those people are coming along to watch on a Saturday, their children are joining the youth. So we're getting that indirect connection. We don't have universities in our area, but we have a lot of connection with our local schools and our local higher education colleges. So we support and host uh, schools tournaments at our ground um, and that further helps to, uh, you know, entice young people into playing uh, the game of rugby. Um, I think we try as much as possible to be as professionally run as an amateur club can be. <clears throat> we, uh, you know, um, we are all amateurs, but we try to make sure that the club is well run, um, is viewed, and and we give, uh, you, know, you know, that mantra of giving a positive experience on and off the pitch. As we've managed to progress back up the leagues, we always try to operate as if we were one level higher off the field than we are on it. So that we we start to look at how do we generate more sponsorship? So should the time come uh, that we get we, we gain promotion and we just missed out last season as an example. Uh, the challenge for us in a Cornish club is that uh, we're three hours from nowhere. So every away match is five to six hours on a bus. Correct. That's yeah, we get no um, support from the RFU for travel anymore. So we have to generate that internally. So so by coming part of the community, by representing clear that uh, anyone who knows the air, this area might have been here on holiday, St. Austell, we are the town, the bay and the clays, the clays is a mining area to the north of the area. So we try to make uh, playing for the club a sense of pride, a sense of purpose and a sense of uh, representation to the area that they live in. And we are now starting to see um, that translate into, into uh, both players on the pitch uh, new youngsters coming into the youth section and indeed spectators coming up on a Saturday and therefore generating that income for us. So, 
Fantastic. So, um, just to come back on a, a point you made earlier on, and, and one that John has, has kind of flagged on the chat, which is a great question actually, is around what barriers are you, are you removing? You mentioned there kind of removing barriers in the transition phases. And one of our big transition phases is that cults into, into adults. You know, what are some of the barriers you're removing? Just just while you're thinking of that question, Paul, I mm -hmm. share with you, we we try and do as much research around this as possible. And we, we, we did a quite a big survey um, with 14 to 18 year olds um, in the last kind of three to four months. And some of the things that we heard back from the players was um, uh, that rugby is um, more affected by focus on academic studies and other sports comparative. So a lot of sports have consistent things about why players leave the game. Mm -hmm. Academic studies, as well, and you mentioned there about like, players who uh, go off to university. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's some the reason, whether that's university or whether that is um, just focusing on getting through the GCSEs or A levels. I'm showing sure my age a little bit there. Um, the the other thing we noticed down is um, is the one that really interested me, especially in my role, was that players who didn't know they were going to leave the game. So they told us on surveys that they wanted to continue into adult rugby. Um, however, because the lack of planning and organisation around that age, they just hadn't made that that next step about where they're going to play the rugby or how they're going to access it. And a lot of those actually left the game. Um, so something as simple as, you know, is that something you're doing just as simple as creating those pathways, showing the different levels of rugby that they can attend, whether it be competitive or fun or social or non-contact, for example. You know, are they some of the barriers that you're removing or are there any others that you, you've noticed as well? Well, a, a, a little bit of that, and I think I think um, I've, I've forgotten who mentioned it. Number that, that said numbers create numbers. What we found is is that you know it, it sort of grows exponentially. You know, it isn't just that you know that there comes a, there seems to be a tipping point where you retain enough that you actually attract even more. I think what we've tried to do is demystify the transitions between going from a six, you know, you know, uh, you know a 15 year old, 16 year old gets to the, the cusp of the Colts and then all of a sudden they're in a two year ban. So it's no longer enough to be the best in your year. You have to be the best in your next two years. And uh, what we've what we try to do then is, is that they, we, we, we try to have very close relationships between our seniors and our Colts. Um, so that they are, uh, and indeed down all the age groups. So our senior players go along and uh, support training sessions. Yeah. Um, so that you know, the, so the so for the younger ones, there is a little bit of uh, you know, um, uh, you know, in very lower case, but hero worship, if you will, the guy they see playing for the first team is now helping. And running their session on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday evening when the when they train. What we do with the Colts is that we get our senior coaches to rotate in, and they you know they, so they start to follow the same broad uh, patterns of play um, and things like that. So that they're, they're, they're playing in the same style and the same uh, sort of game plans that that the seniors have. So that you know we we, we remove that. We, we rotate Colts players to join the first team uh, um, and they do roles as water carriers and that sort of thing. But it means that they're involved with the club. They're, 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 you know, so that, that big step up in joining adult rugby, they, they've already had a taste of it, albeit from the touchline. Um, you know, so it becomes uh, um, you know, slightly demystified. And we make it something that 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 is aspirational, but but at our level, they can actually see that the players playing in the first and indeed our second team, the sinners, are players that have trodden that path ahead of them. So yeah. they know that there's an opportunity for them. And now that we have our third team, the Spartans, there's also a level that where those that aren't quite perhaps as committed or as focused or just want to play now and again, there's 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 an area for them. So what we try to do is 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 make it as easy as possible. They already have got relationships with people in the senior setup. So by the time um, it comes in, uh, you know, in this, uh, you know, the, the restart of training in summer, that first day at school turning up. <laughs> Uh, you know that first day at school feeling turning up on a on a Tuesday the first Tuesday in July surrounded by um, you know established first team players 
isn't quite as galling as it might be for someone if there's no interaction beforehand. Fantastic. Paul, thanks very much for that. Thanks for sharing your experiences. Um, there's definitely one thing I want to take away from that. I really like the idea of that wear at Red Day where you engage the whole club to come down in that. I might might steal that one from my own club and um, cobble a couple you know, claim it as my own credit, to be honest, but that sounds fantastic. Um, but anything, if you're going to give kind of one or two t- tips on trying to, if a club was going to start off tomorrow and say they're going to create their own vision, that kind of Saints way, what where would be the starting point that, or the, the, the one or two things you suggest? Well, I think uh, I think it's about you know how 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 you integrate with your with your area. There, there's yep. you know in in our area um, there is a, you know there's a clear pride in being Cornish, a clear pride in being um, part of uh, the the herit the mining heritage of Sonostal yep. and and the, and the fishing heritage heritage of the of, of around the bay. So those are things that you can uh, you can tap into, and um, you know. You know, being being uh, uh, and making it uh, you know, being clear that actually whatever level of representation you are for the club, it is a source of pride. Whether whether that's the Spartans or the Sinners or the Under Six or the Colts, you're wearing the you're wearing the shirt of St Austell and it's something to be proud of. Great stuff, Paul. Thanks very much for that. I really appreciate it. I'm um, yeah, really interesting to hear and and sounds like having success and. Um, hopefully you, you get the return match against Truro as a, as a positive result as well. Dave, um, can, I, can I just ask, so, so Paul, the first team are called Saints and the second team is called Sinners? That's right, it's Saints, Sinners That's and Spartans. Great. And, that... our, uh, and our um, girls team is called the Angels. <laughs> oh, that's a branding, that is fantastic. Great work. Yeah. Um, Very creative. There's a question about Rugby League, Dave, in the chat. I don't know if you want to, it's not necessarily one for Paul to answer because I'm thinking down in the southwest you might not necessarily have come across that a huge amount. No. <laughs> yeah, it'd be um be good to hear back. Yeah, I know um Cal from um Liverpool St. Helens, I know you'd you'd have that situation as well. It'd be good to hear the specific, you know, how you've got around that. I know um you work well within the community of Liverpool St. Helens on that one. So please feel free to put in the chat some some things you've done to um to to support that kind of players who play in both codes. And similar, I think there's a question earlier on, wasn't there, around um, players who are at private schools or independent schools and, and managing that retention also. So um be great to hear from others on on that one. Laura, just whilst you're on, it'd be great to share some examples you've had from as a club developer and um, especially in the female game about recruitment and retention as well. Some things you've seen that have worked, you know, that's worked really well. Yeah, it's it's always, I always feel a little bit, bad kind of sat here as a as a kind of club developer because we're not the ones doing the doing you guys are the ones doing the doing and we just pick up top tips as we travel around talking to you all um I think the main message is it's always hard work there's never kind of an easy win and I think there's all the stories kind of confirm that it also kind of takes time it's very rare to have a kind of like a, a quick win um, the female game, obviously, I'm guessing most of us will have seen that in the last 10 years, it's come from being small to being what it is now, which is around 40,000 players, I believe, Livesey. It's what we're kind of being told at the moment. Um, quite a few clubs have obviously had a fair crack at it. The main thing that we haven't really talked about so far is the is repeated entrance points into the game. So I think we'll probably be quite familiar with the inner warrior camps. That's an RFU kind of branding thing. But the main idea there is to have a regular kind of entrance point into our game for somebody that's never played before or has had a huge time out from the game. So that player, instead of having to walk into a normal training session, which might be four weeks into an eight week block, if the, if the coach is kind of doing a block cycling, it's an easy point for them kind of once every six months or once every two, two at uh, six months, six weeks or once every two months. Here's a beginner session. Here's if you're new to the club, you can come in. You might not be new to rugby, but it's a this is for newbies to come in, meet us, see what the club's about, find out more and then hopefully return the week after. And um, so those kind of 
intro to rugby or welcome newbie sessions or inner warrior camps as, as we've been branding them for the last few years have worked really well for the female game to kind of re-engage or bring new people in I have seen people do this on the male side of the game as well so Acklam up in the Middlesbrough area have run a like a back to rugby session they started it in January they targeted kind of the social vets males that had kind of wandered away from the game bringing them back in kind of instead of going right okay come back to us but go straight back into our normal training session it's like here's a specific training session for you they branded it as there's probably going to be a lot less running um, just to kind of entice those those people because that's who they were targeting they were targeting their third and their vets team lads that's who they they kind of set out with a very clear purpose they got between about 13 and 14 people regularly training which for them was spot on it's given them those extra lads to then fill into that team that third and, and vets team on, on the weekend um so yeah it's that kind of thinking about right if you're sat on the sofa how do how do we then get them to turn up onto the onto the pitch and you can look at things like the couch to 5k you can take principles from that and turn that into our rugby environment um and, and the other thing that we kind of haven't touched a, around so far tonight is is social media and um, we are in a culture now where if it doesn't happen online it's not happened in real life um so it is a case of making sure that you you post about pretty much every activity that the club are doing and that helps you put that positive spin on things what you're trying to achieve there is your FOMO is your fear of missing out it's the people that haven't turned up to training looking at the photo post training going oh I should have been there because look what I've missed out on it's on the socials after a game on a Saturday going oh I've missed out because I've not been down there and sometimes it is really really difficult to put a positive spin on things if you've had two people turn up to training and you're sat there going how can I turn this into a positive spin online it's a simple thing of taking a photo of of the pint of coke or the pint of beer whatever whatever drink's been had after a training or a dog if somebody's brought their dog down to training it's, it's thinking about these different kind of spins that you can put on things that again it's going oh I've, I've missed out because I wasn't down there um so that's kind of the regular post in positive spin and I think we've put up some really good posters in the pitch up for what has changed now to the social media for community rugby group around how to create that emotional link. And that's worked really, really well for the female game. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Laura. I appreciate it. Some real good kind of things in there that have not been covered tonight. On the kind of social media, we did have it kind of flagged for the end of the session. Um, I've just put on there, if anyone needs any help with the social media, we've got a kind of self-help Facebook group that you're free to join. Uh, and we'll share all our resources on there as well. Just whilst we've got him, and I've, um, I'm really happy to have uh, Neil, if, if you could kind of come in from Augusta's point of view, I know you've been doing some great work um, as a club up recently. Uh, the, the, the thing we're going to talk around tonight was around the new coaching team um, that, and, and the kind of journey that Gosforth have been on. So thanks again for your time and jumping on at, at last minute as well. But it'd be great to hear about what the club have done and, and how it, you know, what impact it's had. Uh, <laughs> well, you, you could write a book about Gosford's Rugby Club, uh, <laughs> and, and, and Laura has been part of that story. Um, um, it's a long story. Um, it, obviously, um, splitting from the uh, Falcons in 1996 had a, a sort of a big impact on the club that we had to start from from nothing. Um, and we have been for a long time very nomadic. Um, we've had four grounds in the last 20 odd years. Um, there you go. And each time we've had our own ground, it's been very, very hard to actually establish a base um, where we can actually generate income um, and, and recruit. But we found as we were changing grounds, we were moving further and further away from our, our home, um, being Gosforth. And with Gosford having a name from the 70s as being one of the big clubs, you know, and probably a lot of people don't understand or know about how we split from the Falcons, a lot of people expected Gosford to be um, a very strong, um, in-depth club. In reality, we were a new club again in 96. Yeah. So we were starting from scratch, um, even though our first couple of years we were actually um, playing a couple of internationals. 
but they happen to be very old internationals. Um, but it, it, and it's taken us a long time to actually get ourselves back um, with our own clubhouse. And that only happened six, seven years ago now. Uh, and that was a, called the Big Project, which is back in Gosforth. Right. And that was us getting a, our own clubhouse, our own grounds, our own pitches. But that brought its own problems um, because in the years leading up to that, we had, whilst we'd moved away from the Gosforth home, um, we'd lost our catchment area, we'd lost our links with schools, the unis, um, and we're probably still relying on the name of Gosforth um, to attract players. And that wasn't happening anymore. And um, in the Newcastle area, there's a lot of clubs. There's a lot yeah. of competition. Um, for various reasons, we'd lost age groups, four or five age groups in one fell swoop to another club because of certain things. Um, so we didn't have that base coming through and we're starting to lose players left, right and centre. When we got to our current ground at Broadway, whilst it became our ground, we were responsible for it with part of some other, uh, other sports. Um, it didn't have the best of facilities, so through a lot of hard work, a lot of fundraising assistance from um, the RFU and Sport England, we were able to put new light, floodlights in and, and drain the pitch and have some decent pitches to play on because players were actually leaving because we didn't have the facilities. Training was very poor because we didn't have lights. Um, we were cancelling second team games because of the state of the pitch, because they were waterlogged, yep. you know, all kinds of things. So to, it got to the stage, and, it, and it's quite peculiar because this decline is, you, you don't notice it. You can't take a step out and, and realise it's happening. And it was just happening slowly, a slow burn down and down. So I think many clubs would recognise that similarly. Realizing. Yeah, I think many clubs recognise like the very rare you lose like a whole teams or sway the players, but you just slowly, slowly, slowly you just seem like it's a bit harder to get well, a team out and slowly. harder and so harder. So it got to the point where some of the senior players were actually had decided they were having families and they were deciding to not play anymore didn't want to play because their friends weren't playing and all the sort of look excuses to the point where we had a, a meeting with, um, with Northumberland RFU basically crying out for help because yeah. we were very close. We were very close actually before we moved back to Gosforth of actually folding right. because we didn't have a base, but we were very close because we couldn't fulfill fixed years. We struggled every time. It didn't matter we, we were going to lose 150 nil or what, as long as we would put a team out. Yeah. And we managed to do that. Um, but what we found is, moving back to Gosforth, we, we've started to grow that school's connection. We've started to grow the connection with, with, the, with the local community again. Um, and obviously, with working with the other sports here at, um, at GSA, so we've got Aussie rules baseball and cricket and we're starting to develop the grounds so the grounds are very visible back in Gosforth people know where we are um, the coaches we had weren't really connecting with the players and um, the people who formed reformed the club like myself in 96 were still the same people who were running the club in 2001, 2002, 2022, um, and we're all getting a lot older, um, and we realised we have to do something about it. Um, one of the main things we did, we got rid of committees. We don't have a committee anymore. We don't have a, um, a general committee, executive committee, any committees. We have what we call streams. And the rugby stream is the main one, obviously, with the, being a rugby club. Um, and the rugby stream are now is now made up of players, current players. So our um, our coach, Adam Ainley, who was unfortunately couldn't make it tonight, he's our fly half, but he's our coach. Um, our director of rugby is our scrum half. Um, the, the club captain is second row. The, um, the social membership is a back row player. Um, first team manager is one of the second team players. 
So I, I they're think. now engaging with all the players and they're talking to the players who are starting to come back. So even this Saturday gone, we um, had a really good game with um, Melbourne Park Elizabethans. Um, a very, um, very a good game of rugby, but we beat them. And, and it was testament to the likes of Adam and Tom um, who have actually brought players back to, um, to get some strength and depth. And we, 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 we've changed it to like Eddie Jones to finishes. So we had a strong bench with finishes <coughs> and it's, it, it's made all the difference. Fantastic. Um, I, I like that idea. That, Sorry, I'm just going to say I like that idea of you know the players taking ownership of some of those volunteer roles that normally you know other people might have fulfilled as well, and I could see a few of my other players in my own club would be able to do that in, in really successfully as well. Sorry, I interrupted you there, Glenn. Yeah, well, well, there's a couple of things. One is because we've set up GSA, which looks after the ground, the old farts, as we'll we call ourselves, um, basically look after the ground, and we, right, okay. we don't get involved with the rugby anymore. Um, we obviously try to find the, the, the sponsorship in behind, but the actual running of the rugby is purely down to the players. Um, and, and they're the ones who are going to grow that um, the numbers. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll resurrect the second team. We now have enough players. Um, we've, we've recruited some people from the Aussie rules who are interested in playing. And uh, some Colts are stepping up. Um, but the Colts, we've worked hard on the transition on the Colts as well. Um, the Colts are all training with the with the seniors now, getting to know the seniors. Um, so when they actually step up, they know everybody they're playing with. Um, and the mini juniors are growing in numbers because, well, a couple of things. One is we've got some excellent volunteers. Yeah. Um, but we're also visible back in Gosforth. Uh, and that's really, really uh, starting to count now because people know where we are. Um, we're running a few you know, events like the Beer Festival, which was really um, popular, but it's putting us back on the map, back in the Gosford area, even though we've still got a lot of competition from you know, our old foes, Northern Rugby Club across the road. It's still there. It's a big competition to us. Um, so I think all in all, we're trying... Let the, let the coaches, the mini junior coaches, the rugby players take control and develop us. Yeah, fantastic. Um, thanks very much, Neil. Also, again, thanks for stepping out last time. It's great to hear the kind of trajectory Gosford are on now, like you said, a, a club with a, a big tradition. Um, but yeah, loving some of the ideas you've put on there in terms of player ownership and some of those roles as well. Getting rid of committees, that's a, a fairly bold step. Oh, I'd like to be on the committee meeting when that was uh, announced or suggested as an agenda item. That must have well, been a fair, yeah. I think Guinness helped. Guinness helped <laughs> Is that team. right? Okay, I get you. Yeah, <laughs> understood. <laughs> the, other thing, the other thing, David, which was, was probably as, you know, and as a topic you, took, you discussed before was social media. We've made some really big inroads on social media. Um, a lot, anything we do pre match, post match, midweek is all on, uh, on social media and the WhatsApp groups and the website and keeping the website live and, and current in, in sync with the Facebook and Instagram, I think it's also had a big impact because that they're the people more Instagram than Facebook these days, but it's Instagram that's it's hitting the right, uh, the right notes, the right people and target in those areas. That's a good segue, Neil. Thanks very much for that. It's just one thing to kind of touch on finally now. Um... We'll, we'll, we'll touch on that and, and share some examples but um, yeah, Neil thanks again for, for jumping on great to hear again like I said around Gosforth um, hope we get the second team out this year I'm sure um, Laurel keep us all up to date with that one as well and yeah um, fantastic for uh, and thanks again for coming on just uh, yeah, just to kind of finalise now on, on a few things um, from our point of view then I'd just like to say a big thanks again to all the clubs have come on so Stuart from Oxford uh, Quinns, who shared some real good examples about um, linking in with their educational establishments there and, you know, going going out to those um, universities and just kind of listening to see what they wanted and kind of amending their offer to support as well. Um, you know, Brian from Prenton there in terms of the work they've done with the communities, but also reaching out to past players and, and just giving them like an easy in. I think something like, like Laura mentioned there, you know, quick ways to get players back involved, like a simple tennis tournament. 
but just going out to the community and engaging in different ways and, and, and seeing how many doors that's opened up. I really like the example from St. Ostalon Paul's mentioned there in terms of, you know, this the pathway through to seeing is that, that wear red day, that engagement with as a whole club and then again similarly links out to community as well and, and what it means to be a player for that club as well. It'd be interesting to reflect on your own clubs like is that something that's really clear for your club? You know, what does it mean to be a player for your club? Um you know, what's the pathway for it? And that engagement is something that customers do. If you looked at like good customer retention, connecting with a brand is, is similar to in sport. Like if, if a player can connect with rugby and they see themselves and define themselves as a rugby player, it's very easy to keep them involved into a sport as well. Um, and again, Gosseth just talking through about after a nomadic experience, giving a bit more player ownership and power and a good coaching team and removing committees. I really do like that one. Um, and how's that engaged? and and there's a couple of consistent themes in there as well that's worth picking out. You know, those community links, those those pathways from, from age grade rugby to adult, and then the use of social media as well. I don't know if anyone's been across or heard about our uh, Play Together, Stay Together campaign. Um, it's something that we're pushing at the moment to try and push for players to keep re-engaging the game, to try and reach um, as many players who used to play the game or have drifted away. There's lots of resources on the England Rugby website around the Play Together, Stay Together campaign, you know, digital assets that you can amend yourselves and use. Uh, we've got a Facebook group for all social media leads as well if they need some support or guidance or you know, sharing of models of good practice. And we'll, we'll keep creating these kind of top tips you can see in the corner there. But what we're really pushing is this kind of connection. I think um, a couple of people mentioned it. I think Brian mentioned it. Like just remembering what, why they played rugby in the first place and it doesn't take much to re-engage and connect back into it also. Um, we've got a big game coming up to push this play together, stay together campaign on Thursday, where the good, the bad, the rugby are going to be running uh, as Haskell 15 versus a Tyndall 15. Um, that will be live streamed on Thursday evening. So something maybe you can jump on the back of that. Hopefully you will have seen the Joe Marler videos, some of the influencer stuff we're doing on Instagram as well. We're just It's all just trying to drive players back to their rugby clubs effectively. Um, so I just thought I'd, I'd kind of plug that a little bit. Um, I'm going to Kind of close off now uh, the webinar, the kind of formal part of it, but happy to stay on if anyone's got any more questions um, for the evening. But just uh, just to finish off by saying thank you very much for your time. Uh, thanks again for those who presented, Brian, Neil, Stu, Paul. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, and again, I'll I'll stay around for the next kind of five or ten minutes if anyone's got any questions or, or queries at all. But thanks again. <laughs>